Wow. Um, I think my takeaway from that was we had borrowed from the future environmentally as well as financially. Uh, and also that individuals have to lead, businesses and governments are trapped by those circumstances. Um, that, that made me think. Thank you, Rick. Um, some tweets. Um, Trends Map says Voyage NZ is trending in Auckland. Um, Ray NZ88 says, what is this Voyage NZ thing? <laughs> and everyone is arguing with Lance Wicks. <laughs> Not the first time. Um, our next speaker's career has been all about innovation. As a company founder, a tertiary teacher, a crown research director, and presently as the CEO of the Manufacturers and Exporters Association of New Zealand. He also writes a blog where the masthead reads, Views expressed here are not necessarily those of the NZMEA. So he's a bit of a rebel. Please welcome Ship's Doctor John Wally. pricing his business out of the market because he can't afford to compete with the wages that are paid in the mines. Western Australia in general is buggering up the east of Australia because their manufacturers can't live with the exchange rate that that bonanza in the west has created. The Norwegians had the same problem and they created something called a National Wealth Fund. They sat down and thought about it on the, on the right-hand list of RICs, the sort of rational side, and said, well, this stuff isn't going to last forever, and so Norway needs to do something when it all runs out. And they created very early on a thing called a National Wealth Fund, <coughs> basically a tax on the stuff that was coming out of the North Sea. At about the same time, the Brits reacted in a different way. Basically, oh dear, this is going to be inflationary, better wind up the interest rates, and that essentially lifted the pound and screwed around British manufacturing industry. Australia is starting to move in terms of its Dutch, Dutch disease and is super taxing or taxing that activity and saying, hang on, the rest of the economy needs the support that your windfall creates. So that's really good. So if there's good margins in your Dutch disease, you can fix it with surcharges. I'm going to talk about New Zealand's Dutch disease and sadly, it's not very robust, it's not very rich, and it sits in that asset speculation world that Selwyn was talking about. So if this works, land and buildings, what we call speculation in residential property, commercial property, or farms, it's about land and buildings. And I put together a comparison of three different sorts of business. The farm business, the software business, 
and a small manufacturing business. So I'm roughly the same size, and I thought this all works. This reader's units when you're looking at the number of staff. This reader's millions when you're looking at the other ones. And so we take a look at assets employed on the average dairy farm in New Zealand, a bit over six million. We look at the debt, two and a half million. Look at the number of people employed at 2.6. We look at the sales, around about a million. This was 10, 11 year. Wages, not very much on the farm, about 80,000 in total. Software business, about 600,000. The manufacturing business, around 400,000. So if you're looking for spreading the love, uh, farming doesn't really spread the love very much, really. And when we look at tax, because we've got to keep the wheels on, the love is even less well spread. And so, think about what's happening there. I'm a farm. I'm carrying two and a half, three million dollars worth of debt. What's that cost? Somebody give me a number. Michelle, work it out. How much does that cost? <laughs> no, no. Somebody give me a number. How much? A couple of hundred thousand a year, 180,000 a year. Where's that money going? Overseas. Overseas, a bit more specific. Australia. Australia. So we are being well and truly milked. <laughs> huh? But then look at wages. There's this business operating. It's not spreading the love because it's not really employing people. Now the farms aren't making much money. So why would they do it? Where's the payoff if you're a dairy farmer? Where's the payoff? Where's the payoff if you're a residential property owner and you've got it negatively geared? Capital gain. So it's some time in the future you sell the farm and retire to Tapamoa, I think is the sort of <laughs> standard deal. And I guess, when you look at tax, if your Dutch disease isn't liquid, how the hell do you deal with it? The asset speculation, and I think we just go through here now, everyone wants a farm or rental property. Returns cover the interest, oops, don't want to go there yet. So, so what we drive people into in the way we've created the rules is speculate. Focus on your balance sheet and don't worry about your income statements because down the track you can sell it all, won't pay any tax on it, you can have a nice time until you cook it. Bit of a problem if your kids want to buy the farm because the debt transfers through the generation. So We've set up these rules. We've set up these rules because when a part of the economy tends to become dominant, the vested interest aligns behind that part of the economy and the rules tend to support it. That's the debt curve. The horrible purple colour at the bottom is government debt. The other colour looks like the colour of my grandkids' nappies, um, is private debt. Now, I could only get numbers going back to 93, but effectively, government debt's come down and private debt's doubled. And that's all reflected in land and buildings throughout New Zealand. That debt is having to be serviced. That service cost is leaving the country. And it's leaving us all poor. If we end up just farming, Selby mentioned foot and mouth, that's got to be our worst nightmare. If we've only got farming, we've, we've got a real problem in terms of resiliency in the economy. And if something comes up there, the blue line is what's happened to the real economy, the stuff that sort of makes us a living in the rest of the world. 
since about 2004. The red line is the domestic economy. So prior to 2004, the two economies, the real economy and the domestic economy, call it what you will, grew pretty well in step. But they started to open up in that middle of the last decade. And that's part of the reflection of some of the things Rick was talking about around raw material prices. We're in a long-term decline, and it isn't right or left. I use GDP figures there. Went back to the mid-80s. Both sides of politics have resided over this decline. Because we haven't really addressed our touch disease problem. So, lessons from the Titanic. We hear about this sort of Titanic stuff, so I better to refer to it in the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, women and children first. When, when selling got a bit more granular, um, there's, there's other lessons you can draw. But the idea of women and children first, even when this thing's sinking, or some people think it's sinking, it still had, if you were a child or a woman, you had a much better survival rate than if you were a guy. So even when things are terrible, even when things are difficult, the received wisdom tends to drive behavior. And the things that we, mental models and assumptions matter, the things that we think about, and the way we think about them, is very, very important particularly in times of change, because when things are changing, our models may not be appropriate. They may even be detrimental to what happens. And I like that one. That used to sort of get beaten into me when I was little. You, know? you make mistakes about the things you know you're right about. The stuff you're not sure about, you don't check. The stuff you don't check, you know you're right. Insufficient lifeboats. Well, opinions differ on why there was insufficient lifeboats. My readings and the stuff I've seen tell me that the shipbuilders were actually incentivized to put fewer lifeboats on there. So they built better ships. And it wasn't going to sink anyway, was it? Nobody got on that ship in Belfast thinking it was going to sink. Most, if you ask them, would say, it's unthinkable. This is the one that I hear a lot. Who's heard people say that in New Zealand when they talk about the economy? Come on, show of hands. Come on, let's have a bit of animation. Who says that? You know, it's going to be okay because people will always want food. But think about this. You're the guy in Shenzhen assembly. 63-inch TV screens. Do you take one home at night? It may well be that we get to the point where New Zealanders won't be able to afford the stuff that's grown in New Zealand. Think about that. So don't take comfort from people who always want food. Uh, ignoring the ice warning. I think Rick mentioned that one. Why are you going to bother with warnings if you think you can't sink? If you think everything's okay, there's no incentive to change the way you approach the world. There's no incentive to think differently. And I'm using you to think differently because I absolutely support what Rick said. It's we in here that change things, not politicians and not leaders. Our pressure brings about change. Primary sector will save New Zealand. Everybody wants a dairy farm. They don't want a forest. They don't want to run sheep. They don't want to run cows. They're sorry, steers. And so I've shown you that dairy farm doesn't perform very well. What do you think the others are doing? No lifeboat drill. No lifeboat drill. What you don't know can kill you. But you don't bother if you don't think it's ever going to be needed, it's ever going to sink. And then what happens if the one 
thing you depend on. Uh, so I mentioned it, the absence of a plan B. We don't have a plan B. And Selwyn talked me into doing this. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're not to do what you normally do. And that is go on about how bad things are. You've got to talk about what we might be able to do about it. So I have tried to do that. But all I can talk to about correction is about options we can start to look at. Because the actual details of implementation are widespread through the policy framework. There's no one, two, three things you can do. But there are a number of things in general we should be thinking about. Uh, remove the tax harbors on land and buildings. <coughs> Bernard ran a piece more than you did. I don't believe you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you. Was it you wrote the piece or somebody else on your staff last week about the interest register in Parliament? Uh, yeah. Was yours? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, yeah. It was Alex. One of, one of uh, uh, Bernard's uh, people wrote an article last week in interest. Our representatives in Parliament, between them, 121 of them, own just under 300 houses. Yeah. Uh, we're voting for cattle gains tax? <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the thing that the subtle alignment of interest, the subtle alignment of, of the economy behind the way we set it up. And we have to change that. Manage the exchange rate. Oh, shit, we can't do that. We haven't got enough money. The Swiss have been doing it since last August. Singapore's been doing it forever. There is a choice. It's one of the things we can choose to do in the same way we've chosen not to do it. Now, if anyone mentioned this, sort of look on my blog, I've written a bit about that on a number of occasions. But, but the whole point is, if we think it's important, it will change. If we disregard it, it goes where it will. Match and mirror productive incentives elsewhere. If I'm in Germany and I want to buy new equipment, I can anticipate the depreciation on that equipment two years prior to it being bought. If I invest in R&D, I can take tax credits for doing that work. If this stage was a, a graph, with bugger all help on this side, <laughs> and lots of help on this side. Here's to, to areas like Korea, Malaysia, Australia, the US, over here. Now you can always, you never, never feel useless, you can always be a bad example. <laughs> this is New Zealand. <laughs> we don't care about the things that would form the basis of a plan B. We simply don't care. And it's, it's writ large through the policy setting. Balance the budget. Spend less and spend better. I'm still personally sort of struggling with this austerity spend, sorry, don't say austerity, fiscal consolidation, <laughs> and whether we should be taking a more active position in the economy and government. I'm still struggling with that personally. But it needs to be debated. It shouldn't be spending less is the only option. It clearly isn't. But if our mindset, if our mental model says it is, that's exactly the way we behave. deal with the intergeneration issues. Why not start signaling that we're going to start lifting the eligibility age for national school? Mm -hmm. And good on you guys for doing it. Why not start talking about it? It, it, just, it just escapes me of, of what the fear is. And the fear can only be the political backlash. that We, we can't talk about this. Stuff. Like, People aren't growing up enough to work out we can't afford to keep paying it. Lower and broader tax take. Well, 
I wouldn't mess around with GST on 